Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, India's future. It will be guided by this man, Narendra Modi, the new Prime Minister. But can he turn around an underperforming economy? From corruption to inflation, poverty to growth, Modi needs to deliver hope to over a billion people. Also this week, Europe's lurch to the right. A reaction to federal Europe or just another nail in austerity's coffin? We look at just how big this so-called political earthquake was, but also the lost generation, the youth who continue to go without jobs. And the car that needs not just fuel, but faith. Sit back and try to relax as the driverless car whizzes you around town at a top speed of 40 kilometers an hour. everyone, we thought it was about time we took a good look at India on the show because it has new leadership, of course, and perhaps a real chance to find its true potential. Think about it, a 3.2 million square kilometre country, a population of 1.2 billion people. Shouldn't Asia's third largest economy be doing better than this? Why do the perennial problems of corruption and poverty, inflation, infrastructure, never get properly addressed? Well, enter this man, Narendra Modi, the new Prime Minister who stormed to power with his party's first parliamentary majority in three decades. He had economic success when running the state of Gujarat. The hope is that he can replicate that at a national level. But then maybe that's just the problem with India. You're trying to bring about change and cohesion on a national level in a democracy of that size. That is hard work. Here's some numbers to get you thinking first up. 269 million people living in poverty at least. That is an estimate the real number could be much higher than that. 10 million people entering the workforce every year for the next decade. Do the jobs exist for those people? And a yearly cost of $6 billion to the economy brought on by corrupt. And you think that's not major? India's healthcare budget is only $4 billion. Then there's growth below 5%, inflation up at about 10%, a budget deficit of 4.6%. In short, India should be much better than this. We've got two reports for you this week looking at the job ahead for Narendra Modi. In a moment, MTS Tired looks at relations with Pakistan. Surprisingly, trade between the two is virtually non-existent. But first, the challenge of turning around the economy. Karish Mavias has this report from Mumbai on the ongoing attempts by big multinationals to invest in India. The Kolaba Bazaar in South Mumbai has been doing a roaring trade for 50 years. It's more than a market, it's a community, with hundreds of small traders supporting thousands of workers. Many here, like shopkeeper M.M. Vishnu, voted for the Bharatiya Janata Party in the recent national elections, securing the BJP a landslide victory. In return, they want the new government to prevent foreign companies from setting up supermarkets in India. Our business won't survive. If big stores open up, our businesses will be finished. It's simple. If people go to a mall, all the small businesses will be finished. The people who earn daily wages, they'll earn nothing. The BJP has promised to protect these mom-and-pop businesses by preventing outside investment in multi-brand retail. But the new Prime Minister Narendra Modi has a reputation for aggressively pursuing foreign capital. With more than a billion people, India is a massive market for companies like Tesco and Walmart. There are very few supermarkets here to compete against. So if they can get permission to open stores, they could make huge profits. The consulting firm Deloitte predicts the retail sector here will grow by at least $230 billion next year. The potential for investors is enormous, but economists insist consumers will also benefit from what's called foreign direct investment or FDI. One of the problems plaguing India is high inflation and uh, particularly in the fruits and vegetable uh, segment, grocery segment, so to say. And it is believed that if the foreign investment comes in in this area, if you have uh, 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 FDI into multi-brand retail, that is going to unleash a lot of activities which are going to be positive for inflation control. But before committing their capital, investors want the government to guarantee a business-friendly environment. Firstly, I think they need to stabilize uh, their whole taxation system in India which means there should be no unpredictability. Uh, similarly, there are laws about um, land acquisition, which are really unfavorable. In Kalaba, vendors are counting on the government to keep things as they are. Their survival depends on it. 
For Counting the Cost, I'm Karishma Vyas, Al Jazeera, Mumbai. Business isn't as good as it used to be at this tractor assembly plant. Over the past few years, sales have dropped by nearly 30 percent. Industry insiders say a power crisis, especially in rural areas, is to blame. It's made manufacturing, routine maintenance and repairs almost impossible. Irfan Akil runs the Lahore-based Millet Industries, one of Pakistan's largest agricultural machinery suppliers. He hopes Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's historic visit to India will allow his business to grow on the other side of the border. If trade opens up, opportunities open up, then our companies uh, would have the uh, you know, ability to expand. Sharif is the first Pakistani leader to attend the swearing-in of an Indian prime minister. Since his election last year, he has promised to improve ties with New Delhi, but relations remain tense between the two countries, which have fought three wars since gaining their independence from Britain in 1947, mostly over the disputed Kashmir region. Sharif released 151 Indian fishermen on the day of Narendra Modi swearing in. Both countries have hundreds of each other's prisoners. Most are fishermen who strayed into the territorial waters of the other nation, and many remain in jail despite the completion of their sentences. I believe, Prime Minister, when he goes, a lot of forethinking. And, and let it not be the first and the final visit. Both leaders are focused on reviving their country's economies. Opening up trade will no doubt yield significant economic benefits for India and Pakistan. But long-standing tensions over the disputed Kashmir region are never far. Nawaz Sharif has been prime minister twice before. The last time he was in power, his attempts to improve ties with India were derailed after the military attacked a territory in Kashmir held by India. Shortly afterwards, he was ousted in a coup. And while Sharif no doubt wants to improve ties with New Delhi, he'll have to do so carefully. Impiaz Taib, Al Jazeera, Islamabad. So there's a lot to talk about. Let's do that with Prashant Sawan. He's a senior economist at the risk advisory firm Maplecroft, joining us from Bristol in the UK. Look, Prashant, India is almost too big to talk about. There's so many facets and elements to think about and maybe that is part of India's economic problem as I said before it is a democracy and it's splintered into all these different states which you know in many cases have a lot more power than the federal government has really trying to find a cohesive way forward in that situation for example the way China does it's always going to be very difficult Absolutely. Um, as you rightly said, it's like an uh, elephant, a mammoth, and then everybody has their own perception about how to look at India, uh, when it, whether it comes to economics, when it comes to politics, when it comes to social aspect, or when it comes to environment aspect as well. And uh, the main reason for the slowdown uh, has been, can be attributed to various reasons. Uh, uh, if I pick one point, I would say the corruption, which has been uh, rampant in the last uh, few years especially. Uh, we saw the scams uh, unearthing in the mining sector, in telecom sector. And that has also basically put off many foreign investors from investing in India. And uh, uh, that has been the main reason behind uh, why there has been no uh, foreign investment in India in the last few years. Uh, in fact, according to Maplecroft Corruption Risk Index, India is ranked extremely high uh, when we compare about 180 countries uh, globally. And that also shows that uh, people are still risk, uh, not willing to take risk uh, while it comes to doing business in India. So am uh, I right in saying uh, that's that, Prashant, one part so, of sorry the to interrupt economy. you, am, am I right in saying that the corruption affects everything? It affects, you know, the right people getting the right jobs. It means that they can't buy land or if they want to buy land, then they're going to pay off this guy and that guy to keep the land and all the profits coming off it. I mean, does this, and it is a blanket term, corruption in India, does it pervade every aspect of the economic cycle there? Absolutely, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, it also uh, pennies uh, spent uh, at the top level when it gets down at when it comes to real investment, it's hardly a cent or even lesser than that. Many times it just evaporates uh, in the bureaucracy and uh, in the middleman. And that has been uh, the main frustration uh, behind why we see a huge anti incumbency wave and that saw the overthrow of the Congress uh, government. Uh, 
massively. They were left uh, with less than, 50, uh, less than 50 seats, 44 seats uh, in the recent election. And we saw an emergence of BJP as a single majority party. Uh, people are hoping that Modi's government uh, will be able to tackle with this corruption. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a hope. It's an optimism. I would call it as a cautious optimism from my side uh, because there are various angles how uh, Modi's government will uh, look at uh, not only India's economics but also its politics and also its uh, external relationship with the other countries. What do you, from your assessments, make of Narendra Modi and what he can possibly do? You know, we were discussing here in the office this week the idea that India it almost needs like a Lula da Silva from, from Brazil, someone who will be able to bring the country together the way that Lula did in Brazil and make India as a whole realise all this economic potential. Well, that's, that's one way of putting it. Uh, I know some people are also uh, trying to put an analogy with Margaret Thatcher, uh, somebody who is uh, very decisive but at the same time very divisive. And uh, uh, as, as we know, India is, is unlike Brazil, it's not a mono-religious country. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it has various ethnicity, various religions. Also, uh, it is, uh, each state has its own uh, way of uh, doing business uh, when it comes to uh, their own people. And uh, therefore, the task is uh, not going to be as simple as uh, he would perceive. I'm sure he's uh, definitely aware ab about that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, from the from the uh, from the business point of view, um, uh, his camp as his election campaign was bankrolled by the corporates. Uh, he would like to make sure that he'll be more pragmatic uh, when it comes to foreign direct investment or when it comes to uh, taking economy to the next stage. But at the same time. Uh, he has to. Uh, he will be uh, uh, binded by the uh, the ideology of the party, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, many times uh, when it comes to, for instance, Swadeshi, uh, when he's trying to develop relationship with the uh, neighboring countries, including even the U.S. and also the Western countries. Uh, the, his his regime will be tested against the party ideology. And that that is uh, that is that is what we have to wait and watch really because we are just in uh, just few days after uh, he's t taking in charge mm -hmm. of the uh, portfolio he has allocated the ministry again a very 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 uh, compact ministry which is also uh, a bit worrisome because the power is again he's trying to make sure that uh, most of the decisions are vested with him and that's why he has uh, that's one way of looking at uh, his. Uh, uh, compact ministry portfolio. Prashant, you started to talk about overseas issues there. I wonder if we can touch on that a bit more. You mentioned the United States. I want to look at Pakistan, obviously. Uh, you know, the importance of improving, obviously, political ties there, uh, but the economic and the trade ties as well. Uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he has surprised everybody by inviting uh, Nawaz Sharif. Uh, to uh, his uh, swearing-in ceremony and uh, at the same time he has also invited uh, the neighboring countries which are the SAC uh, countries including Sri Lanka and Maldives and even Bangladesh. Uh, it's, it's, uh, he's trying to uh, convey different messages. Uh, one of course he's uh, making sure that uh, he wants to improve relationship with China. At the same time he's also making sure that now uh, he is showing himself as a leader in that region. Uh, let's talk about Pakistan first and uh, both countries understand uh, only through economic ties these relations can be improved further. Both countries are in need uh, to improve their economy. They, both countries want to leapfrog to the next stage of growth rate while it comes to economy. There are quite a few similarities. Uh, uh, the language barriers is uh, is almost nothing between these two countries. That should facilitate good trade. The border should be uh, another reason why the trade should be there. Both countries uh, have a uh, core competencies in sectors such as textile, for instance. And uh, in, in fact, in India, uh, this year, India is uh, in Bombay, they are having a textile uh, exhibition where the Pakistani companies would be showcasing their products for the for the Indian companies. And there, there seems to be a, a gesture, there seems to be a, 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 a instances where a slow movement of the economic ties are uh, building up between these two uh, nations. Prashant Salman talking India with us this week. Thank you for that, Prashant. And still ahead on counting the costs. Look, no hands.
In fact, no steering wheel, no bumpers. Just who is controlling this car and would you even get in it? Decide for yourself a little later on. Now to Europe, and while most have been looking at the fallout from the European elections this week, we want to remind you of where it came from. Yes, we all know about the anti-immigration debate, that is a major factor, but don't discount the anti-austerity factor either. Here's just one example. Portugal. Youth unemployment stands at 35% right now. It's not much different across many other periphery countries. Raising concerns about a potential lost generation. Barnaby Phillips has this from Lisbon. Two months after she left school, Sarah's days are following a predictable pattern. She looks in the newspapers for jobs. Many offer small salaries and short-term contracts, but she calls anyway. And sometimes, like today, she goes to an interview. She's already been to 20 in recent weeks, so she tries not to get her hopes up. I send CVs and people don't reply, or if they do, they tell me that I don't have any experience. After so many no's, I've been starting to lose motivation and stay at home, as it seems just so difficult to get a job. The problem for young people who've suffered unemployment in a country like Portugal is that there may be long-term consequences. Economists believe that their future career prospects, their earnings, even their happiness can be affected by a spell of youth unemployment. And so, even as economies start to grow in Southern Europe, the consequences of this crisis could be felt for decades to come. Claudia is slightly older than Sara and is an experienced set designer for the theater. She likes to keep busy, but the work has dried up. She hasn't had a regular job for almost two years. In these conditions, she says, it's not possible to start a family. I have many friends in a worse situation than me because I don't have children. I have friends who have two children, school to pay for, health care and so on. They have to ask their parents for help. It's our parents' generation that's keeping us going. For Sara, there is good news. The hostel where she had the interview have offered her a job. It only pays a few hundred dollars a month. Not much to live on in this city. But young Europeans are desperate for just a start as it becomes more and more difficult to break out of the cycle of unemployment. Barnaby Phillips, Al Jazeera, Lisbon. So what do you do? Well, you can exercise your democratic right to vote and try to bring about change that way. Certainly that was evident in these European elections. The right-wing parties, those who are largely anti the European project, made some big gains, setting off the alarm bells in London, Paris and Berlin with their calls for less of federalist Europe. Let's talk about that with Tanya Abraham. She's a political analyst at the polling agency YouGov, joining us from London. You know, Tanya, people got quite excited about this, uh, a political earthquake, they said. How do you read it? Because, you know, turnout wasn't that high everywhere. And when you look at the numbers, I don't know if it's really a move to the right. It's just that the right made some gains. Yes, yeah, so what we have found at YouGov is that from what everyone has heard about the election so far, around a third of people came out to vote for the elections. And we found that from our polls in the run up to the election, the UKIP party has gained considerably in the run up to this uh, to the election last week and we predicted that they would gain around 27 percent and indeed they did at the outcome of the election okay the immigration debate has been well documented of course but uh, and i'm not just talking about the uk here i'm talking about right across europe how much of that might have actually been a vote against austerity you know the people have just had enough over the last few years of the financial squeeze that's been put on them I think there are two sides to the debate here. We've recently seen that living standards and the economy have been improving recently and people are noticing this. But we've also seen with regards to the types of voters that are attracted by parties such as UKIP that there are often people who are disillusioned or disheartened or even disappointed by what the traditional parties are offering. And they find that parties such as UKIP offer an alternative option for them which they feel suits them better. Okay, given everything that has gone on in the last few years in Europe, did the turnout numbers, just to go back to that, surprise you at all? You sort of feel that people have a right to vote and they should use it, especially if they don't feel they like the status quo. Even more so given all the difficulties that have been in Europe these last few years. 
I don't think it's that surprising, to be honest. I think looking back at previous elections, the turnout has been roughly the same. I think there was the um, possibility that having, at least in the UK, having the local elections and the European elections on the same day may have helped things, but I don't think it was ever going to be you know, a, a massive, considerable and majority turnout. But the fact that around a third of people did come out to vote is fairly consistent with previous polls as well. And, and what do you think, just finally, on the whole European project? You know, the European dream, is this starting to signal a shift away from that, that people have gotten fed up with the idea of union? You know, we've written here, uneasy union. Um, they feel maybe that, yeah, there are other options out there as opposed to this union. It's definitely something that a lot of people are considering when they think about firstly the country in relation to Europe and about their place within you know, the national picture. Um, I think sometimes this is dependent on a few things. Firstly, we have found from our polls at YouGov that at least in Britain, support to remain within the EU still outweighs that of it leaving. So people still would prefer to be within the EU. However, they would also like significant changes within the EU to be made. And I think the the relationship between this and also the popularity of more right-wing parties is an interesting debate because while people consider themselves to be you know noticing the importance of staying within the EU they also want more national power as well within their country so I think for these parties it will be an interesting journey at least in, in Britain in the run-up to the general election next year to see how they use this momentum and whether they can continue that on into the election run-up in 2015. Tanya Abraham from YouGov, lovely talking to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Finally this week, the car with no steering wheel, no brake and no accelerator, which begs the question, why on earth would you want to get in it? Maybe the fact it's made by Google would give you a bit more confidence. For me personally, no, I need to be the one driving. But who's to say the self-driving car won't be the norm one day? Jake Ward went to take a look in San Francisco. Everything about cars involves faith. I have faith right now as I'm crossing the intersection that none of these guys are going to suddenly hit the gas and plow right through me. Everyone around us at the Giants game today is assuming that no one's going to just jump the curb and come upon them. Well, Google has now extended that faith even more deeply and arrived at a design that does away with any sort of brake or accelerator or that icon of control, the steering wheel itself, and instead has just gone with a simple start button and an emergency stop button. The design evidently stems from Google's realization that its employees who had been commuting to work via the original self-driving car design weren't ready to take control of the wheel if necessary. And that was one of the fundamental design concepts, that the car would suddenly say, hey, construction area, hey, you know, a cat's in the road, you take the wheel. Well, they decided that, that people are really not ready for that. They're falling asleep or reading a book or texting. They're not going to be startled into taking the wheel at a moment's notice. And instead, the new design paradigm needs to simply do away with these drivers completely. So these are just passengers that you see in, in the video that Google released on Tuesday night. People just get in, strap in, they've got plenty of leg room, they've got a little room for their groceries, but otherwise they are simply passengers. They are subjecting themselves to the whims of the car the same way that you and I subject ourselves to, to the whims of, of a train driver or a bus driver. This is not really owning a car, in fact, and that's Google's whole point. They imagine these cars being pretty much interchangeable cocoons that just carry you from place to place. You order up your instructions, your destination with a smartphone app, you say, hey, I want to go to the movies, you press that button, and it takes you there, whether you're conscious or asleep or whatever it is you're doing. And so this new paradigm of people as simply cargo is not only full of liability issues and all sorts of technical issues, it's a simple fundamental act of faith that's even deeper than what we already do in the car environment. Yeah, but Jake didn't get in the car, did he? That is our show for this week. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com. You click through to the programs link, and from there you find the Count of the Cost page. It's got all our previous episodes to catch up on there. You can also get in touch. You can tweet either me, at Kamal AJE, our business editor, at Abid Oliver Ali, and you can use the hashtag Counting the Cost as well, as you saw in the show. Email's there as well. Counting the Cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. Thank you.